Hello, everyone. This is Chris Bachman. I'm the faculty advisor at Cal State for the Baja and Formula SAE teams. I'm going to put together a short video on continuously variable transmission design and tuning, otherwise known as CVTs, as, as this is, I find, one of the more kind of confusing aspects of the design of the vehicle. So first, a little bit of just why do we even use a transmission? So this is the data from the Briggs & Stratton engine, relatively flat torque curve. It has a peak in engine power around 3,200 to 3,500 RPM. So, and typically when you design your powertrain, you want to be, your engine to be able to be at its max power at all time, because for any fixed velocity, the amount of force you can use to propel yourself forward uh, is related to that power. So, and that force can be used to help you accelerate, overcome drag, rolling resistance, or go up a hill, for example, in the case of hill climb. So really you need to stay at you know, as much power as possible to help you get as much force propelling you forward as possible. So in the ideal case, if we looked at your engine's RPM as a function of how fast you're going, you'd sit right at the peak power the whole time. Unfortunately, because your engine is directly connected to your wheels, there's a relationship between the engine RPM and the rate at which you're going related to the gear ratio, GR here, divided by the radius of the tire. And so for a car with gears, which I show here, typically you'll have a point where you have some slipping in your clutch until you get into first gear. You travel along first gear until your RPM goes above the peak power and you start going away from peak power. And then you drop back down in second and so forth until you go to higher and higher speeds. So the idea of the CVT, one awesome part about it is we could potentially, we could be able to shift. And then once we go into first or kind of first gear, then we could reach our optimal RPM and then we could stay at that peak power the entire time. So that's the, that's the idea behind why to have a CVT um, in, your, in your vehicle. So let's talk a little bit about how we generate this shifting at a constant RPM. So the continuously variable transmission will have two pulleys. So pulley on the left will be connected to the engine. We'll usually call that the primary pulley and this pulley on the right we'll call the secondary pulley and will be hooked up to your wheels, potentially through a gearbox. And initially, the, you can tell that the radius on the primary will be small and the radius on the secondary will be big. And the pulleys in these cases that this V-belt sits in can move in and out of the page as we're looking at it now. And so what will happen is the Radial pulley sheaths will get closer together and we'll push the belt out so that you'll have a bigger radius on the primary. And the opposite will happen on the secondary where the two sheaths will move away from each other and the belt will come down inside. And what really dictates this is how much, how much force is being applied on the belt. You can think about the primaries pushing out into the left, the secondaries pushing out into the right. And you have two components, both a radial force that's that the pulleys are pushing on the belt plus a centrifugal force, which we would call a fictitious force because it's actually the minus the mass times the centripetal acceleration. And so this concept, this concept will help you determine when the belt, when the belt is shifting, as these two, these two are have both of these components that are working against each other. So let's, let's talk a little bit about where these where these forces come from. So how does it generate this radial force? So the way we do this in the CVT is we generate some uh, contact force between the belt and the sheave, and that will be normal to the surfaces. And so whenever we clamp the two sheaves together, there will be a component of radial force that will push this belt out. And so we increase the clamping force, we're gonna increase the radial force pushing it out, and it depends on the sheave angle. So next we'll look a little bit about, all right, well, what clamping force do you even need um, just even to grab the belt? So this is, uh, so, you know, initially on the primary, the belt will just be uh, sitting stationary and the primary will be spinning and it won't even be grabbing it. So you need to even know about, well, how much force do we need to, to grab it? And then, and that'll kind of set some of the, fo uh, the forces in the system. So if we do a little just, some of the forces in the X direction, including the radial force, this fictitious centrifugal force, and the taut side tension on top and the slack side tension on the bottom. We'll have the X component of those, of all of these, we'll have to 
uh, equals zero. And we'll do most of this analysis at equilibrium under an equilibrium assumption as uh, that's even hard enough for getting into the dynamics of the system. And for these right side, we can actually relate this to the torque. And the way we do this is we use Euler's formula, which relates the top side uh, tension to the slack side tension through this exponent with an effective coefficient of friction, which depends on the groove angle of the sheave, as well as the, the wrap angle. The, that's the angle that the belt is in contact with the pulley. And then you can take the difference between those two tensions and the radius uh, of the pulley, and that'll give you the torque on the system. All right, so, so let's go into a little bit more detail about these forces. So if we define a few things, so the wrap angle is the angle that's in contact with the pulley, so that's theta. You can find this departure away from horizontal of these tensions, which is theta prime. It's pretty easy to get from theta, as well as the groove angle phi. So you have this first term, which is just integrating these two forces on a per wrap angle basis to get the x component. And you have the radial force, which gets from this clamping force. And this prime just is on a per wrap angle. And there's two of them because it's being pushed on both sides. And this tangent phi over 2 is because of the angle that's turning the clamping force into the radial force. You have this term for the centrifugal force. Um, so you have kind of a, a mass term and then a v squared over r term. And uh, you can look at, we have a video with a more detailed uh, analysis that we're going to be releasing shortly, which you can see for how we derive some of these. And then you have this term over here for the x components of the tension with the cosine term, turning it into the x component. And this was just a rearrangement using the relationships we showed earlier. So this is really about, all right, well, how much, how much clamping force do you need to deliver this amount of torque? And you don't want to put excessive amounts of clamping force because that'll wear out your belt and it'll cause your system to be inefficient. So not only can this relationship be used to determine if you have enough clamping force to transmit the torque through that pulley. But this can also be used to determine the RPMs while you're shifting out. And so because this belt is connected from the primary to the secondary, the X components between the two will actually be the same. So this term on the right will be the same. And what you want to do is to compare this term for the primary to the same term on the secondary. And the points at which these are equal will determine the points at which you're going to be achieving while you're sh shifting out. All right, so let's talk a little bit about implementing the systems and why they use the physics that they use to generate these clamping forces. So on the left is the primary connected to the engine. On the right is the secondary, which is eventually hooked up to the wheels. As we mentioned before, this primary, we want to sit right at its peak power point for as long as possible. And so that's relatively easy to design a system that will maintain a, the clamping. So it has a constant torque. So we're gonna want basically a constant clamping force. And so that's, that's relatively easy to design. Some of the tricks come in into the secondary. So initially, so this is a, a little model that we made where it predicts the tractive force as a function of velocity, simulating the acceleration of the vehicle. So this has a gearbox ratio of eight. So there's a paper by one of our students that they published in SAE. So that'll be down in the description of the video if you wanna take a look. But as you can see, initially, this is a four wheel drive. So it's roughly the weight of the vehicle, uh, the tractive force that you have propelling you forward. And then it decreases related to the power that you have. So up to 10 miles per hour, you're limited by your traction. And so you can see that because your secondary is directly hooked up to your wheels, that your torque on your secondary will also follow a similar profile. So initially it'll be quite high and then the torque that it needs will actually decrease. And so as, as you're going faster and faster, you actually don't need as much clamping force on the secondary. And if you had a constant clamping force, this would actually be an issue because it would wear out your belt and it would cause your system to be inefficient. So the idea is, all right, so how can we how can we have a system where the uh, clamping force will decrease as our torque decreases? And so this is where some uh, little ingenuity comes into play. So the way the secondary works is it has these two pulleys, the one on the bottom and the one on the top. And so in our case, this is a gauge CVT, the one on the bottom is hooked up to the, the output that goes into your gearbox. And this top one is actually free to rotate. 
And so as the half of the kind of friction from the belt is turning that top sheave, that gets transferred through a bar, which goes right through the other pulley and is free to move left and right and gets bolted down into this cylinder object, which then when it tries to rotate, let's say uh, counterclockwise, as we look at it, it's going to push on a roller right here. And this roller gets pushed. And as it gets pushed, that holds this longitudinal force, which is uh, delivering the torque. So the torque actually of this top pulley gets transferred all the way through to this backside here and then gets pushed through this roller. And so half the belt torque needs to go through this roller. Plus you have a torsional spring right here, which will also, which will also be wound up to push against, push against this, push against this roller. And that force divided by gets divided by the helix radius to create that torque. And so the helix radius is basically if you drew a line down the center of this CVT would be the distance out to the edge of this helix. Uh, and so, and because you have this ramp angle, that's going to generate a clamping force. And so you have both the longitudinal force, the an orange force divided by the tramp angle plus the spring also acts somewhat as a linear spring to clamp onto this belt. And so that's the clamping force of the secondary. And so we put this uh, into an equation form. The clamping force of the secondary will have the component from the linear spring, plus it'll have the component from the torsional spring, plus half the torque on the secondary, that's what S stands for, divided by the tangent of this ramp angle, as well as the radius of the helix. And so as the torque decreases, so does the clamping force. And not quite proportionally, uh, because you do have some initial, uh, you do have some initial pretension in the spring here and in the torsionally and linearly. And as this thing rotates down and in, those two will both grow. So we talked a little bit about the secondary. Let's talk a little bit about how the primary generates its clamping force. So in this case, they use a system of flyweights that will roll out against these ramps, which will clamp it, clamp it down. So we'll take a look at that one more time. So the centrifugal force that's pushing out these, pushing out these flyweights causes them to push down on the ramp and, and causes this pulley to clamp down. So you can see this on the right, you can see these kind of heavy brass, brass flyweights and you see this ramp right here. And so you can tell in this case, I've removed, I've removed this black kind of case around the outside. And so you have this um, mass times V squared divided by, divided by R to get, this, to get this clamping force. Again, you can see, you can see some, of the, some of the derivation in one of our other workshop videos. But we have, this is the omega is the angular rotation of it. And the radius is the radius of how far from the center line these object, these um, components are. And then we have two terms. We have one uh, from the ramp angle. So that's the angle of your ramp. Plus you have your link angle. So this is a two force member. And so this angle right here will also come into play. And then you also have a linear spring that sits inside of here. And as this thing clamps down, it's going to press more on this linear spring. And so this will, so th this number, this value will, will remain relatively fixed. And as it shifts, this number is going to get smaller, smaller and smaller. Um, so, sorry, larger and larger. So let's talk a little bit about the phases uh, that the CVT goes through during shifting. So this is the performance, of the engine versus the speed. And so first things are that Initially, as you move the engine RPM up above idle, at some point, the centrifugal forces from the flyweights are going to overcome the primary spring tension in there. Uh, and so at that point, you're gonna start to rub against the belt and you're gonna have some friction and it's still gonna be slipping, but it's gonna start to slowly propel your car forward. And you're gonna speed up the engine uh, and continue to do that until the flyweight force overcomes like overcomes the compression enough that it also is grabbing onto the belt enough that it can transmit the torque. And that torque is going to steadily increase and increase until you have your primary radial belt pressure becomes to overcome your secondary radial belt pressure, which at this point is going to start to push the belt on the primary and it's going to pull it in on the secondary and you're going to start to shift. So one way in which you can adjust this is with the 
flyweight mass. And so a uh, nice way to do this is to use different, uh, use different masses in the flyweights, which will decide when this will overcome the, overcome the secondary belt pressure. So, and then you want this shift out to be as straight as possible. And so, and this whole time along here is your shift out. And to be able to do this, you can adjust the primary ramp shape to be able to turn more of that uh, centripetal force into clamping force, or you can change some of the primary spring stiffness to be able to do this. So let's talk a little bit about kind of the order of operations in terms of um, uh, tuning as well as adjusting things in the in the CVT. So first, what you want to do is you know select your secondary ramp and spring, and you want to keep that clamping force you know 10 to 30 percent above what is needed on the secondary. And, um, and so really that's gonna set, set a lot of the forces inside the system. And this, is, and this will keep your belt from you know, having uh, too much wear as well as uh, your system from being inefficient. So a lot of the adjustments will on the secondary, you start off with just set this clamping force uh, on the secondary. Then you start to think about, well, the next you know, really important thing is to get this shift out uh, RPM to be right. So you begin to adjust this shift RPM with the primary flyweight mass. You can also do it by the initial angle of your ramp, uh, I suppose a little as well. And then you start to think about, all right, well, once I have these first two items right, I wanna get this straight, the shift out to be as straight as possible. And so at this point, you start to think about adjusting things like the primary spring stiffness, as well as the primary ramp angle and how it changes. So, and keep in mind that you know you need to do you need to do this first and third thing throughout the shift, right? So you need to keep the clamping force right on the secondary throughout the shift, and you also you also um, you also need to look at throughout the shift as the as the flyweights roll down the ramps. You know how is that? How do you want that angle to change or uh, be fixed? So the last thing. Uh, and because it only happens momentarily, it's not as high a priority as others is to kind of adjust the engagement RPM with the primary spring tension. But usually you don't, you won't change the, the spring constant. In this case, you'll maybe just use some shims to adjust kind of, to adjust the pretension of this spring to help you get that engagement, um, uh, you know, close to you know, around you know, your peak torque if you, if you can. So that's a little bit, that's a little bit of the order of operations, but you know, don't forget that everything is interconnected here and you can't just change one single aspect of the, of the, of the performance without changing other things. So here you really have to think about the physics as you're changing things and iterate slightly, but understand the kind of order of importance and, um, uh, and what I've recommended above. So with that, good luck tuning that, tuning that in or making some adjustments. Um, check out our workshop on this if you want to see more details of some of the derivations in these areas. And here's some just useful, useful relationships when thinking about belts and pulleys. All right, good luck.